Street Life Ministries is a Christ following nonprofit that serves homeless folks on the Mid Peninsula. We meet really interesting people. And today, we'd like to share one of those with you. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am here with a friend of mine, uh, Robin Vaca, and she is going to tell us a little bit about who she is and her journey and her life uh, on the streets, off the streets, all that. Um, but before we get started, let's just go ahead and give this to the Lord, okay? Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, God, for uh, Robin's heart. Thank you so much, God, for um, all the things that you've done in her life, Lord. Just the journey that she's taken um, to get where she is today, Lord, that you have blessed her in so many ways. And uh, I just pray that whatever uh, she shares with us today on this podcast, Lord, that whoever hears it, watches our video, um, that they are too blessed and they see um, a way out of any circumstance that they're, they are in as well. So, Lord, we just ask you just to continue to bless uh, Robin in her life and her journey, Lord. Thank you so much. And we pray these things in your son's name, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, hi, Robin. Hi, Pastor Dave. How are you doing? I'm great. Awesome. It's I'm been a, great. It's you, been a minute. It's been a minute. So, um, first off, where were you born and raised? Uh, I was born in Hawaii, raised in Hawaii, and in Seventail County. Awesome. So you've been here pretty much all your life? Um, well, we commuted back and forth. My father was the supervising engineer of Qantas Airlines. So oh. we would come here, go to school on the weekend, go back home, and we did that for a while. Okay. Yeah. So did you go to school here mm -hmm. and then? No, here, and then go back home. Okay. On the weekend. I'll go yeah. home on the weekends. Mm -hmm. So where did you go to school? Oh, Lord. I went to uh, Abbott. You know Abbott? I do know where Abbott. And I went to Hillsdale for just a little while because I didn't like Hillsdale. You know, okay. It was an all-white school. Yeah. You know, Pastor Dave. Mm. I... <laughs> you know? Wait, wait, so what nationality are you? I'm Hawaiian. Hawaiian. I'm predominantly Hawaiian, yeah. Okay. And uh, Chinese. And Chinese. Mm -hmm. Okay. So both a mom and dad? My... Father is Hawaiian and my mother's Hawaiian Chinese. And you were raised by both mom and dad? No, I, I was raised pretty much by everybody else but my parents. Everybody else, but, so, yeah. So tell us a little bit about that childhood. Um, and my childhood really, you know, wasn't much to tell. I thought, I mean, I, we weren't like any other normal family. I mean, we didn't have birthday parties and we didn't. My father, when my parents got divorced, my father said, You wanted these kids, you take care of them. And my mom uh, got a job at the sheriff's department, and her whole thing was her career. You know, she didn't have time for us. So mm -hmm. we had aunts, uncles in Hawaii, an aunt here, you know, that we went to all the time. And pretty much, because my mom being the youngest, she just kind of went off and did her own thing. And we basically raised ourselves as best we could. Yeah. You know, and... uh like, I, I, I remember as a child, like, people, they would go have birthday parties and things like that, and they would go on vacations and things like that. And, like, as an adult, you know, when you're sitting around with your, your other people you work with or your friends or stuff, and they talk about, oh, when I was a kid, I did this and I did that, I can never have those conversations because we never did any of that. Yeah. Never. And how that make you feel? At the time, I just thought that's the way everybody was. But right. when growing up, as it makes me feel very like it doesn't feel good, you know. Right, right. It's like I'm, I'm. I just wondered why. How come my parents weren't? You know, it just it, it's not a good feeling. It wasn't a good feeling. Sure. At all. Sure. It was very lonely feeling. Like I could go to a party, and nine times out of ten, I won't speak to anybody because mm. I really have nothing to talk about. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of brothers and sisters? I had. I have a, a brother and a sister. Okay. My other sister, she died. And your brother? My brother's in I Italy. And My brother, yeah. He, uh, he's special forces in the army. Okay. And he's been there since he was 18. See, we all left early, my mom's house, because uh, my mom was abusive. Mm. So every, we just cut out. Yeah. Is your mom still here? Yeah. Margaret? Yeah. yeah. Oh, she's still alive? Yeah. Okay. Do you ever talk to her? No. No? Don't, no. don't want to? No. Okay. Does she live around here? No. Okay. She lives in uh, Roseville. Roseville. Yeah, okay. She worked here with my stepfather, you know, and uh, 
my mom married my stepfather, who's a deputy. My mom was a deputy. So once that happened, I mean, we pretty much, like I said, raised each other and raised ourselves. Uh, the only family I really had was uh, my ex-husband's family. Yeah. You know, that was a family. I mean, they did everything together, you know. Uh, I pretty much... Um, I was pretty much like a, a follower and a loner. If I wasn't with my own, then yeah. I felt very out of place. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I, I, I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere. You know. Sure. It was. It was yeah. So, um, so tell me about this. How long were you married for? <laughs> oh, I don't know. About ten, fifteen years. Oh, like really? That. Yeah. And you have kids? Oh yeah. How many kids do you have? Two. Two kids, and where are they are, where are they at? My son's here in Millbrae, and my daughter lives in East Palo Alto. Okay. They're eleven years apart. Are you guys pretty close? Oh yeah, my kids. Oh yeah, they're solid. You know, okay. I, uh, they say it takes a whole village to raise a child. They're right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm Polynesian, so the whole family gets involved in raising your children. You know, we were we were separated, and I would pay. You know, I've always worked. I would pay to have my kids go down to Rancho Cucumunga to see their dad. I had to pay for it, for them to go down there and come back and whatnot. And so my ex-husband, he's full-blooded Tongan. He came and got my daughter and took her down to Rancho Cucamonga. And then he left her in Rancho Cucamonga with another Tongan lady. And he ran away with another Tongan lady and left my daughter behind. Mm. So then uh, my mother-in-law found out and they sent my husband's cousin to go get my daughter and they started fighting over her. So the police said that if they didn't stop fighting, that they would take Lonnie, her name is Noah Lonnie, from, uh, from the lady. And the CPS people would, would take her. So uh, his mother-in-law, my mother-in-law called me and said to go get her. Well, by the time I went down to Rancho Cucamonga, Alex had beat me there and he took her and he was gone with her for over a year. Mm. That my ex-husband's family is wonderful. They're like wonderful people. They really are. So you don't feel like shooting them anymore? Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> We're so, good uh, friends now, Pastor Dave. I mean, we talk and everything. Oh, okay. But, you know, he, he went to therapy. I mean, he, yeah. you know, you don't wake up and say, I think I'm going to beat my wife today or I think I'm going to hit my girlfriend. It's a learned behavior. Sure. You know, and I learned that from being with Miss so, Shirley. So how many years How many years did he put his hands on you? Mm -hmm. Pretty much the whole time we were together. I'm really sorry to hear that. I'm, that sucks. I, I, yeah, I, it does. Me being a man and, and knowing that that's something I would never you, do. But I you just, know what? It, it seemed that at that time, the, the, the Polynesians at that time, that seemed to be the thing to do. Mm. I wasn't the only one that had long black eyes. I mean... Yeah. All the other girlfriends, and they had them too. So I'm like, wow. But sure. at that time, I didn't really realize, you know, I do now. And I, I know it's not, you know, it's wrong. And I've, I've learned through therapy that it's not a behavior that they're born with. It's a behavior that they grow up with. And that's how that happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so let's kind of fast forward a little mm -hmm. bit. So, um I know you from Redwood City. I know yeah. you from being homeless in Redwood City. Right. So in between married and two kids, mm -hmm. and then uh, you and I running into each other, mm -hmm. I think I met you over by the corridor, I think. Uh, I can't remember where I met you, but I, I know I ran into you somewhere over by that area in Redwood yeah. City. Yeah, you did. And then and, uh, everybody... Called you Auntie. Auntie. Yeah. 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 And so, um, so I knew right away, like when I first, like from the very first time I met you, yeah. I knew that you ended up getting a lot of respect from like everybody on the streets. And it's really interesting how everybody m more more or less kind of had drama with each other, but they all kind of went to you, and yeah. you kind of kind of dealt with that. So, um, tell just tell the you people know, who are listening to this or that are watching this video, tell tell people a little bit about. What it's like one being a female living on the streets, and and to just just living on the streets. You know, um, it's a funny thing because what I found when I was living on the streets was I never I didn't have a problem. 
And you know, and which is unusual. Most females, they have problems because they're either alcoholics or they're far, you know, addicts. And I think I didn't have a problem because it could be because of the way I was raised. I was, there were certain things you just don't do. And, and one of those is, is be promiscuous. I was, I could just, it just wasn't happening. And, and also I think because I come from, I come from a family of cops and criminals. So because of that, everybody knew who I was related to on the criminal element side. And a lot of people knew who I was related to on the cop side. All here in Redwood from San Bruno all the way down to San Jose, even San Francisco. So that right there was like, uh oh, you know, especially my crim the criminal side of my family. You know, I had never had any problems. I also found that growing up in a family of cops, you learn how to maneuver the system, the court system. You, you learn about all these different departments because that's where your parents work. You know, and you hear about it and you, you go to the jail because your mom's there and you have to wait for her for an hour or whatever the case may be. Growing up like that, I learned. So when I became homeless, I also found that there was nobody to guide them. I mean, there was no, even in Hawaii, when there's homeless encampments, there's somebody there mm -hmm. that can guide them to whatever, you know, and if they can't, they find somebody that can't. I, um, seeing this, I was like, what the hell? So, I mean, I became friends with everybody, you know, and, and whenever there was a problem, I knew how to solve it or how, how to help them to solve it or where they could go to get help. You know, uh, the homeless community, back then it was an actual, I think, community, more so now than, than ever because they, everybody looked out for each other. Granted, they did their little stealing from each other and things like that, but it's not like it is now. Now it's really bad to be homeless. Yeah. It's very rough out there for, for if you're a girl, you don't want to be alone because there's a lot of people who don't even uh, belong here in Redwood. They're, they just come here because either resources, it's easier for them, or, or but they don't haven't actually grown up here or even been a member of the community for you know a long period of time. So uh, I never had any problems, Pastor Dave. Yeah, it, yeah. it's the, it's unusual. Yeah. I, I really didn't. I mean, I never got hit. I never got anything. And I, I believe, I really believe it's because of the criminal side of my family. Right. You know, I okay. mean, who's going to want to mess around with a bunch of polys, right? Right. Especially big ones. Right. Uh, I didn't know that polys came in any other size. Oh, Pastor Dave. Like, yeah. I thought I thought most polys came either large or extra large or XX large. Well, yeah. Well, and, and, and you know, it's funny because when I was living behind Burger King, so my nephews heard about it and they're like, where's auntie? So they parked their car and it was like the sun was beginning to set. And when they were coming in, walking in, I go, oh my God, they're there. And I had, I wanted to hide because if I, they found me, I would get in trouble. And all I heard was, look how big they are. And their shadows made them look really big. But they came walking in there like this and we're looking for our aunt. And everybody went, she's right there. You know, they just like told on me. But you know, uh, it was a good feeling to know that, you know, even though they are the way they are, that they cared, you know, about sure. me. And they always came down to see me. And you know, and I would ask them, oh, can you give this person a ride? Or can you take her to the store? You know, yeah. they were always accommodating, you know, and they were really, I, you know what, Pastor Dave, really, that was probably the best experience in my life was mm. being homeless. Because yeah. I learned a lot, you know? I yeah. learned that uh, I'm not the shit like I think I am. You know, when you come from a family of cops and criminals like mine, you think you can have anything you want. You can do whatever you want. Nobody can tell you anything. Oh, yeah. I had a severe attitude. 
Really? I never noticed that. Really, Pastor Dave? I mean, really, I, I was just, like... I'm just kidding. Oh. I mean... I, I, I saw your attitude when you were homeless. Yeah, I, I you know... Because, I mean, let's face it, when I, when I met you, you were using... Oh, yeah, and that wasn't very nice either. I was like, what do you want? Yeah. You know? So, when did you... Okay, so I'll... I'll I can't so, we've me. been in Redwood City for eight years. Yeah. I met you through... Oh, I met you through Miss Shirley. You met me through Miss Shirley. You came to Miss Shirley's and I was there. I was the only girl, Miss Shirley's. Uh, that's where uh, I met you. That's where you because saw we me. launched our Redwood City site. Our first site was at Miss Shirley's. At Miss Shirley's by Seven Eleven. That's right. And then you moved over here across the street from the church. Right. So yeah. you okay, and then you've kind of came over to there. No, Miss Shirley made me go. Miss Shirley made you go. Yes, yeah, she said, "Go on around the corner and go see Pastor Dave." I go, "Who? Take your ass around the corner and go see that man and tell him you want to work." I'm like, "Yeah, okay." And as I'm going out the door, Chappelle, go with her. Miss Shirley would send somebody to go with me because she, she knew I would go to the left or go to the right. I would never go straight to where I was supposed to go. <laughs> and, you know, Chappelle was one of Miss Shirley's, and uh, he would tell on you in a minute. So I, I remember coming to the church and seeing you there. I go, there's that preacher guy, you know. <laughs> and I would just, you know, make sure you saw me but never come talk to you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, now look at you. Now look at me. I work for you. How about that? <laughs> huh? So, uh, so when, when, how long have you been housed? Five years. Has it been five years? Yeah. So you've been over in that one spot for five years? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. So tell, so, okay, walk, walk through that okay. process. So who helped you? How did that, how did that transpire? You know what, Pastor Dave? Okay, so when Life Moves first came out here, um, I didn't even know about them. They just, you know what, Pastor? I can't even tell you because I don't even know because they just showed up at my tent. Mm-hmm. There was no, I had four workers, one right after another. They kept leaving, you know. I, I remember that. Yeah, and then the, my last worker was a, 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 a Holly girl from Hawaii. She was from Hawaii, and she was a, a worker over there in Hawaii. And at that time, I was like, Life Moves workers would come over to my tent and say, do you know this person? Can you help us find this person? Can you? So I'd go, okay. So I would help them do whatever it is they needed to do. I even helped them with their little survey. They had, a, they had to take a count of people in the parking lot at Kmart. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. You know who did that? My worker just drove and I knocked on the doors and had them fill out the survey and gave them a gift card. Hmm. Yeah, I started doing that then. I mean, I, it didn't, I didn't care, you know, right. as long as it was helping somebody, you right, know what right. I mean? I think I've always been like that. You know, I don't like bullies. I didn't like people picking on other people. You know, I was a fighter. I fought a lot. You know, I, I was always for the underdog. I've always been like that. So the place that Life Moves got you into turned out to be a pretty good place you because know, you've been there for five years. I've been there for five years. The woman who owns God the house bless and you friends, me, right? Pastor Dave. No, I didn't even know them. No, no, no. Now. Oh, now they're like family. They cook for me. They, I mean, they watch Lola. I mean, they... Yeah. Yeah, it's like I'm family. Five yeah. years. And I'm the only one I know that still has their place. That's cool. Yeah. And and I, I, I and don't... Has it, been a, has it been a good adjustment for you? It was a hard adjustment, but it was a good adjustment. So, you know, so I, I, I now believe that everything happened to me because I have God now. You know, I never believed in God before. I was like, yeah, okay, right. So really quick, for people who watch this and listen to this podcast, mm-hmm. I have a lot of Christians and church folks that don't know a lot about um, the homeless lifestyle. Oh, wow. That watch this. So the reason why we do this mm-hmm. podcast is for those viewers and the followers of this um, get kind of a view of what it's like. So, so for for let's say for you, you get up in the morning, you go to your bathroom, you wash your face, you brush your teeth, and you're off. You know, doing whatever it is you need to do. For a homeless person, they get up and they look around and they go, "What the fuck?" They can't go brush their teeth. They can comb their hair maybe if they can do that, but but it becomes they become lost. The longer they're homeless, the harder it is for them to come back. Mm-hmm. Because 
Believe it or not, you grow accustomed to your surroundings. Mm -hmm. You have to or you won't survive. You know what so I mean? what so then so what is the transition like going from homeless to house? For me, it was difficult because they moved me from I was behind Kmart and I moved up Jefferson to Alameda. <laughs> now it's not a very far distance, right? It's a very short maybe two minute, three minute car ride, something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, when you're homeless and you're going from point A up Jefferson, I kept going, this is so far, this is too far, you know, because I was all of a sudden out of the area that I knew best into a whole nother area. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to get used to it because it was so quiet. Mm -hmm. You don't hear shopping carts, mm -hmm. you don't hear the train, you don't hear periodic yelling, you know, you don't hear any whistling because homeless people would whistle for each other. You don't hear any of that. And it's very strange. Mm -hmm. And it was very difficult for me to get used to. So it was only scary quiet. Yeah. Yeah. And I, so I would turn the TV on, turn the radio on, and turn all the lights on. And I still do that. I still leave my TV on. Yeah. Yeah. But how, how is it now, though? Oh, I love it. Yeah. I love it. And they tell you. You know, they say, well, you don't bring anybody to your house and blah, blah, blah. Well, you know me, Pastor Dave. I, you know, I take a lot of the girls up there to, so they can take a shower. And, and my landlord doesn't mind. You know, my landlord doesn't mind. Okay. And I know you're not supposed to, but, you know. I get it. You know what I mean? I, I, I you know. God gave me all these things. He didn't just give them to me and say, here, it's for you. Right. He gave it to me for a reason, and he knew I would do what he wants me to do. So, and now you have, so now you... you now I have a big family. Now you have a big family. Big, like 150, 200 homeless people. Right. So <laughs> now, so you also work for Downtown Street Team. Mm -hmm. And tell us about that. Oh, I work for Downtown Street Team. Uh, Pastor Dave sent me there. Do you remember when you told me to go there? I keep sending you back. And you keep sending me back, and I was like, Pastor Dave, they do this. I know. Hello? Like, really? And, you know, at first I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to go because I was like, I am not picking up trash for these people. I'm not doing it. But what ended up happening was I picked you pick up. You pick up trash for us. Well, that's different, P Pastor Dave. That's a whole different ball game right there. You know, that's yeah. different. I ended up becoming their outreach worker. And, and because I knew all these camps and everybody, I brought other people there to work. Mm -hmm. And um, it's good. It's good yeah. now. You know, you see some, some stay, some go, some move forward. You know, it's just, it's a starting point for them. They need something to get them to have structure. Sure. You know, to get up at the same time every day because they're going to go to work even though it's only like three, four hours. Yeah. It's something they do every day. And at Downtown Street Team, they help you get with services like housing. They don't do it themselves, but they'll, they'll connect you to the person that you need to talk to right and then they advocate I'm a good advocator and now and you also work alongside of my wife yes and, I do and help her with outreach oh yeah stuff. oh yeah you Sean's like, great you know she's not like I, I'm gonna you know pastor I'm a little rough around the edges you know what I mean I mean like for instance uh, this one lady uh, the other that I I was introduced to over the phone a homeless person called me and she said, Roman, can you help this person? See, I mean, even if I don't like you, Pastor Dave, if you ask me for help, I will help you. Mm -hmm. You know? And uh, she had some issues and I called Sean. I said, Sean, I, I, I mean, you got to get over here because you know how to deal with this kind of thing. And then same with another young lady we had this past weekend who started crying on me. Just broke down and cried on me, Pastor Dave, and I'm like, oh, okay, don't cry, hold on, just don't move, you know, because she was in a very bad domestic violent relationship, and she uh, she didn't reach out to anybody. She been, has been here for eight months, and nobody has seen her, but I saw her. 
she used to come to our church, you know, to the uh, to the to the da, um, Street Life Ministries, and I knew that was her, but it didn't look like her because she she was so like she didn't have that smiling face anymore, and it, mm-hmm. I knew something was wrong with her. So I was running down the street, you know, I looked like a bad woman. I was yelling her name, and she turned around. When she turned around and looked at me, it's like she just like looked like like she had this blank stare right. on her face. Yeah. So. I stopped her and I talked to her for a minute and I, I knew something was wrong. I just said, Sonny, what's wrong? And then she started to cry and I was like, oh, okay, don't cry. You know, when they start to cry, Pastor Dave, I'm like, uh, don't do that. Yeah. So I called Sean. I'm like, Sean, she's crying. You got to get, get over here. And Sean came and Sean took care of it. See, I reel them in and Sean takes care of all the other stuff. <laughs> well, that's a good work. Yeah, that's I mean, you know, good. that's what I do. I, I, I don't have the ability to sit there and talk to you to, to you know, to what is what's the word I want? Counseling, counsel you. Right. I'm not a counselor. Right. All right. My job is to help you get to the right person, and I will do whatever I have to do to get you there. Sure. And then once I get you there, I call to make sure that that person is taking care of what they need to take care of for you. Right. And that's what I do. Cool. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So, um, out of all of this, mm-hmm. is there anybody, any people, or any any agencies that you want to say thank you to for all of for your journey? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a person of, uh, like, don't tell me, show me. You know, you can talk all you want, and if I don't see it, it ain't happening. Mm-hmm. And I, I think that's why I was so, like, I would come to, you know, your ministries, this ministry. I would come to see Carol, socialize, and, you know, but I never, like, you know, okay, so there's a God where I don't see him, so, you know. But I had all these different things happen to me in a short period of time through the church. I mean, and major things, like uh, I had cancer, it went away, gone. They don't know what happened to it. This is gone, and cancer runs in my family, very much so. Then I had sciatica. I couldn't even walk. Remember, I was walking a little mm-hmm. walker. I come to your church. They have a healer there. He prays over me. Next day, gone. Oh, Father Ram. Yeah, it was gone. Yeah. Never came back. It hasn't come back. I can ride a bike now. I couldn't ride a bike before because I had sciatica. Um, and then, uh, oh, the major. Then, after that, after the sciatica went away, I started really doing more to help people because I was like, okay, well, maybe there is a God. I don't know. We'll see if how long this lasts. Right? So I'm waiting for it to come back. And it's not coming back. So I'm like, okay. So I start helping people more and more and more. So I'm on my bike and I'm on my way to church. And it's a Monday night. Now, anybody who does drugs and gets clean or tries to get clean will have these little, oh, maybe I could go over here. You know, nobody's going to know. Pastor Dave said, well, I was thinking that as I'm standing right, you know, wait with my bike on the corner of Jefferson and Alameda during commute hour. Time for Robin to go across the across Jefferson. Little hand goes up. I get on my bike. I start pedaling. At the same time, I'm thinking, oh, if I just ride over to this house, nobody's going to know. I'll be on time for church. It'll be all good. As soon as I thought that, boom, I get hit by a car. Everybody else is stopped. They're obeying the stoplights except for this one lady. This bitch hits me. I go from this crosswalk to the next crosswalk. I thought I died. Mm. I laid down, I sat up and I went, (laughs) and I looked up, and this is the first time I heard God, and God said to me, stay in your lane. Mm. I said, okay, thank you, thank you. I got up, and the lady come running over to me, can I help you? I go, get the fuck away from me, you know, like, and I'm like, okay, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry. You know, I was, I mean, she hit me hard past me, I flew, everybody got out of their cars, they're on their phones like this. I made that woman take me to church. She dropped me off at church. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If it was the old Robin, I'd have got her name, number, and suitor and make sure she went to jail. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
But I wasn't even thinking about it. I was just thinking, I got to get to church. Yeah. You know, so, and then I, you know, I, I mean, I didn't have a bruise, Pastor Dave. There was nothing. She hit me hard, and I, no blood, no nothing. So later on that evening, I was like, okay, God, I mean, you could have tapped me on the shoulder. You haven't had me hit by a car, really. But then I thought about it, and I know I don't, you know, God sends me these little signs, but I kind of go, eh. So that's why they hit the car, you know. Sure. But then, and so as I, as I started working more at the church, you know, like there's this, you know, Vicky and Kevin, Mm -hmm. uh, I, I thank the Lord for them every day, you know, because I have a, a lot of questions, you know. I go, but what about this and this? You know, I question everything. That's sure. just the way I am. And I would go to Vicky with everything, you know. And what about this, Vicky? And, and Kevin with everything. And what about this? And what about that? And, I mean, I would go to Pastor Dave, but I'd be like, uh, not much to ask him. Mm -hmm. uh, I respected him, but, but I don't know. There was that bridge that I just didn't want to go all the way over. Yeah, hmm. but then something happened, and and you know, you know my little dog. I have a little dog named Lola. Well, she's not my dog. She's my daughter's little Frenchie bulldog, and uh, she had an injury to her back where she was paralyzed from the from the back down. She couldn't walk, and um, the vet said to put her down. You know that she she would suffer, and for us to put her down. We refused to put her down. Refused, and the vet said that there was nothing they there was nothing they could do, and we just weren't hearing it, you know. So we took her home, and the vet gave us some medication for her, and she said, "This is the last hail mary." And I was like, "What's hail mary got to do with this?" You know, I didn't realize that when they say this is the last hail mary, it's like this is their last chance. Did you know that? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. So I was so. She wasn't getting any better, you know, and it, and it was a, on a Sunday, and uh, I just knew, you know, I just knew that we would have to put her down, you know, and I was like, okay, God, you know, and then I was like, is there a heaven for dogs, you know what I mean? This is when I start thinking about all this, and I think Vicky called me to see how I was doing, and um, I wasn't doing good at all, mm. you know. And so that's when you came over, Pastor Dave. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, oh, Pastor Dave's here, you know. And uh, you, you came to my house. And you didn't have to come to my house. And I know that. Mm -hmm. But you just, you, you showed up, you came. And uh, you prayed over Lola. And the next morning... That very next morning, that little dog got up, her little legs were shaking, and I woke up talking, get up, get up, look at Lola. And she was standing, but she was shaking, but she was standing, she couldn't stand at all because she was paralyzed, she was dragging herself. And I was like, there's a God, Tommy, there's a God, I'm convinced there's a God. So for me, everything that's happened to me, Pastor Dave, has been because of my affiliation with your ministry, you see? Mm. Every everything, you know, I got the cancer, and and that's when I went over to Miss Shirley sent me over there, and then when I went back to Stanford, they don't know why, they don't know what happened, they don't even know where it went. Mm. They just said it's gone, you know. And I was there with my whole family, you know, and I and they 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 had no explanation. And I looked at them, I go, I do, I think it's God, maybe, mm. and we left. And then uh, my sciatica, you know, and Tommy was like, go ask him to pray over you. He can, he's a healer. I looked at Tommy like, what have you been smoking? I thought you were clean. What have you been smoking? You know, because I didn't, I still, I was a non-believer. I still didn't believe. Because like I said, for me, you, you have to show me, you know. And so these things that, that have happened to me have happened because of your ministry and because of the people there. And, and I want to tell you something, Pastor Dave. I, I, you know, I wholeheartedly now believe that there's God, you know. And, and God has blessed me in ways that you will never even, I mean, I'm never hungry. I'm never with that. I don't make a whole lot of money. I don't have a whole lot of everything, but I have a whole lot of happiness and I have a whole lot of God. 
which makes up for everything that I could ever want. And, and, and God has been good to me, you know. And, and my purpose now is to help other people. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not, I mean, I don't know too much about the Bible, but I believe that God kept me here for a reason. Mm-hmm. And that's my whole mission. And, you know, if anything, uh, you know, I, you know, I owe you my life, Pastor Dave. You know, I don't know how, you know, I don't know how you, like, put up with me. I know I'm a lot. I mean, I know that. And I know I, you know, I could be a lot. I could be, like, a real lot. But, um, you know, my life is good today. You know what I mean? And, you know, I I have everything that I need. And, uh, you know, I think about it, you know, all the time, you know, and I think about if if Vicky and Kevin weren't there, you know, always to advise me the right way to do things and not Robin's way, which is usually the wrong way, you know, and, and, and I, I get a lot of advice from you. I get a lot of scoldings, too, but, you know, I have to learn how to live right by the way God wants you to live, you know, just because I do help people doesn't mean I know how to live the right way. You know, I, I bump my head a lot, but it's okay because I get right back up and God shows me the right way to go. That's awesome. And that's, so that, you know, if anything, it wasn't downtown street team, it was Street Life Ministries. Oh, that's sweet. It's the truth. Well, thank you. You're welcome. That, Robin. You're welcome. Wow, that was a powerful story. Thank you so much. Well, it's the I, truth. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. All right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>